Ready, set, go. Registration is now open for the Middle States Commission on Higher Education 2023 Annual Conference. It's in Philadelphia, December 4th through 6th, 2023, setting the standard transformation through accreditation. You don't want to miss it. Register now at msche.org. Surprise! We're taking the EdUp Experience podcast to Insights EDU. Join us for an incredible higher education marketing and enrollment management conference February 20th to 22nd in Phoenix, Arizona. Register now at insightsedu.com and use promo code EDUP to save $50 off your registration. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to add up on the Add Up Experience podcast, where we make education your business. This is Elvin Freites, co-founder of the Add Up Experience, and I'm here today, one-on-one, uh, with a very interesting guest to talk about some really interesting stuff that he's working on. His, him, and his team are working on. Uh, but before we get to him, I just want to say thank you, as I always do, to everyone out there, the thousands of you that have purchased our book commencement the beginning of a new era in higher education that was written by kate colbert and uh, my co-founder dr joseph salustio and with contribu- contributions by myself so please go to edupexperience.com that's edup experience.com to learn more about the book to learn more about all of our 700 plus episodes that we have published to learn about our president series uh 230 something plus that we've interviewed from all over the world uh, and to jump on our mailing list and to you know stay in touch with us and, and that way you know where we're going off to next for our next conference where we like to podcast live. So uh, edupexperience.com, check that out. All right, great, enough of that. So uh, let me get into our guest. Uh, I am uh, pleased and honored to welcome Benny Boas and he is the CEO of Upright Education. Benny, how you doing? Great, thank you so much for having me. Well, thanks for being for, uh, with us, Benny. I uh, appreciate your time. Uh, I know uh, everyone's busy, so whenever someone wants to come on and and, and chat with us, I, I always appreciate their time. Time is so valuable, so thank you for that. Uh, all right, Benny, so let, let's get going. Uh, we always like to level set and ask everyone, what is it that you do and how do you do it? So my name is Benny, and thank you again for having me. Um, I am the founder and CEO of Upright Education. We are the leading platform providing digital reskilling programs for community colleges and regional universities. Okay, got it. So um, let's let's dive into that now, Benny. So that was very general. (laughs) Let's go layer layer by layer, right? Um, So why don't we talk about? uh, It's a boot camp essentially, right? Right. Okay, got it. so to get into the how do we do it? So we work with, well, first let's talk about the problem. Oh, good In call. the US, there are what I believe an amazing engine for driving um, outcomes through higher education. And those are our regional universities, our state universities, our state colleges, our, our, um, our community colleges. And a lot of these schools, while they have the, the reach to impact lives, across everywhere that's between New York City and LA, um, yeah. rural areas, tertiary markets, secondary markets, they don't always have the resources to be able to provide the programs that can really quickly help adults transition into a new career. That's and as we approach a time where career transitions are becoming a, a it, sort of the, 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 the rule itself and not the exception to the rule, we have to figure out a way that we can provide these programs such as coding boot camps or um, digital marketing boot camps, mm-hmm. uh, data analytics boot camps, really short form or short term programs that help quickly reinsert adults in the workforce at a lower cost and greater opportunity model. And in in general, the way that we help serve learners from all across the country is we work with these colleges to offer through their usually continuing ed department or workforce 
farm or uh, or professional ed, really just where they're hosting non-credit programs. We offer to their adult learners in their geographies and, and within their reach. And so these are net new learners, right? We're not going into their undergrad degrees and into their master's degrees. The opportunity to host branded boot camps. So that means that these colleges are able to have, let's say you're the community college of Vermont, a community college of Vermont boot camp and enroll learners at what is usually half of the cost yeah. of a traditional boot camp. Yeah. So so I guess what what, I, what I'm curious to learn about is when you were thinking about this business idea, what made you think about uh solving this this challenge, right, with boot camps? And and when you thought about that, um uh, you know what was the process for you to say these are the programs that students need to get through very quickly at a low cost, right? To then be able to take that. Are you calling it a certification? Is it a credential? No, I'd like to know that. What are you calling it? And then using that to take them to the next level in next level in their professional career. Well, so here's here's the problem. The problem is is that adults live busy lives. Yes. And <laughs> yes, oftentimes do. they are doing that while not having the financial padding that they need to be able to either take time off or um, put put a bunch of money down in, on education. Yeah. And so because adults live busy lives, what's really challenging when somebody wants to switch careers is they often are considering, okay, what are the training and education programs that will help me get there the quickest, right? They're not thinking, how do I stack credits and get yes. into, uh, and, and get out with a degree? They're thinking, okay, what what can I do now that in six months from now will present an ROI? At the and cheapest cost, right? <laughs> lowest cost, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what is cost? Cost yeah. is an interesting um, framework for how we talk about education because there are lots of different ways you can frame cost. Cost is, um, of course, the money that you pay out of your pocket. Yeah. But cost is also opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's every day that you're not working in a career that is bringing you to, to, your, to where you want to be, whether that's financially, personally, or in terms of fulfillment. Um, you are delaying the opportunity to earn more, to be present with your family when you when if you're if you need a sedentary job or need to work from home, um, or to be able to um, or to be able to have a a option for career mobility to have a ladder to climb. Right. Yeah. Every day that you put that off, that is a cost. Now, sure. what are the other costs? Mm -hmm. Costs are also associated with um, with time. Um, to placement, time to new opportunity, time um, to uh, time to time spent submitting applications, time spent, you know, yep. in, in the program itself. Um, and so what we think about is what are we doing to create the highest ROI for learners? So when they enroll in the program, where do they get the most return on their investment with all of those cost considerations in mind? Um, and so what we what we believe and and what we know to be true currently is that if you're looking as an adult to be reinserted into the workforce or you want to switch your careers or you want to reskill into a different job, yeah. the best way to minimize that cost is through minimizing the time it takes to get to that job. So you can call it a boot camp, you can call it um, a, a you know a fast track reskilling program, you could call it an accelerated learning program. Um, but the the result is the same. The result is when you get out, you are on your way to a new career. Now, what does that mean from a credentialing, accreditation, um, credit standpoint? Um, so our programs are not accredited. Um, we work, like I said, on the non-credit side of the house, um, which generally is sometimes a, and then we can pick this apart later, Elvin, but it can be sometimes a conversation blocker with some schools, but generally what we found is that learners aren't, they don't care about, they don't want the piece of paper when, 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 when the, the degree at that moment that they're thinking, okay, how do I get my next job? They want all the skills that they can get to get out of the program and then into that next job. Yeah. So 
what does that mean from certifications? Well, we do offer badging and um, and uh, and well, digital badging and certifications through our program. But are they industry standard? How do you in, how as an industry do you standardize the certification of let's say software development? It's a large field, so. Yeah. There are lots of different technologies you need to learn. There are different applications for those technologies. So what does certification mean there? Well, for us, it the certification shows that you know how to, dem you've demonstrated your ability to be able to pass the program and, and acquire the skills and apply the skills. But for the industry, there really is no industry-wide recognized certification or credential that deems you a software developer. So while our, our courses do present badging and certification options, there are no really industry recognized certifications in, in a lot of the areas that we teach that are really the um, unfair advantage for our learners when they graduate. Like you're not, they're not, it's not like an underwater welding program, an HVAC program or a nursing program where the certification gets you the job. This yeah. is more that it demonstrates your ability to, to, um, to use your skills in a professional setting. Got it. So is that why when you created uh, Upright, is that why you focus on, and I'm looking at the website programs such as digital marketing, that analytics, tech sales, which I really love, by the way, I think tech sales is so anything with sales, I'm a big fan of um, UI, UX design and software engineering. Yeah. Is that, that was the thinking. So here's, here's the, 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 well, let me give you the sort of the impetus and the reasons behind why we chose the courses yes. that we offer. Okay. There are a lot of different jobs within the realm of tech and there are, and especially with the digital skills you acquire to get those jobs. Uh, now, when we think about what are the programs that our learners are going to want to take, we have to decide who define who our learners are, right? Okay. We work with a lot of community colleges and regional universities. And what we found through um, through really doing a landscape and uh, or a, a survey of the landscape and, and market analysis is that those learners are looking for roles that are less on the highly technical end of the spectrum. So when you think about tech jobs on the very high end of the technical spectrum, you have, you know, maybe cybersecurity, um, uh, you know, uh, data science, machine learning. Um, and then, you know, in the world of digital jobs on the less technical end, you have like digital marketing, tech sales, right? And so, um, so what, so, so, so for our learners, we found that the less technical areas where they can train into are more appealing, but that's just our demographics. Now, what does that mean from the program development and construction? I find it fascinating that in, your bachelor's program, you can, everyone spends about the same amount of time or a similar amount of time earning credits to deem them um, bachelor degree ready yeah. by the end of the four years, despite the subjects being wildly different, right? Like, why is it that that somebody's studying um, comparative literature versus, you know, I don't know, um, computational biology, have or or let's put it this way why does you know why even in the arts alone like somebody studying painting under their in their undergraduate versus you know modern dance well i went to bennington so i'll, I'll say modern dance like why why does it and and what outcome does those four years and that amount of credits need to equal that amount of time spent Right. And so that's the sort of that's sort of what we've like, why does that does that produce do those same does that same amount of time for these wildly different subjects produce the same job outcomes? I, I, I you know, then and that's that's something that I sort of started to think about in my undergraduate a lot because I was kind of all over the place with what I studied. But the the point is, is that we kind of tore that apart when we came up. Right. We said, OK, it actually doesn't take the same amount of time to learn tech sales than it does software development. Tech sales, it's a, a very different kind of program. You said you like tech sales, right? Mm -hmm. Think. Let me ask you, what do you think is the highest value of our tech sales program? Um, just basically on what I, I've seen, it's uh, consultata consultative and social selling. Uh, I saw that uh, bullet point and, and I love the whole idea of social selling. That's a high value for me. 
So that's the interesting. So you go right to the skills. You're like, these are the skills that are yes. valuable for that program. I actually Correct. don't know if that is the most valuable part of a tech sales bootcamp. I think the most valuable part of the tech sales bootcamp is cutting through the noise of applying to entry-level SDR or BDR sales development rep or BDR business development rep jobs on LinkedIn by having your stamp of, of, uh, of or your upright stamp or your CCV stamp or et cetera, saying that you completed tech sales bootcamp. Because what that does is it signals to recruiters out there that you actually want to get into the role of tech sales. Think about how many people just graduate from from, from an undergraduate or master program, whatever, with a, basic, with a pretty fundamental business back degree or pretty general business degree and are like, okay, I didn't know what a business degree meant. So I'm just going to throw my resume into the ether and you know say that I like sales. But they might not actually really want to do sales. Yeah. And recruiters have to spend a lot of time figuring out, okay, does this person actually want to do a sales? job or not and like if, when you're going through 700 resumes and it's entry level and you don't really have a lot of prerequisites to get you that first entry level sales job what you really just have to figure out is will this person stay past three months and do they even know what sales is mm, yeah. and so tech sales boot camp is sort of that signal to the market to say hey i completed something that shows the recruiters and employers that i actually want to do this job mm, and no, so I, yeah, okay. the skills are almost secondary to that Mm -hmm. Because what happens in a tech sales program is that the skills you learn are, of course, important in getting to know a CRM and how to build a pipeline and follow up, et cetera. All of that's really important. But you really learn most of those skills on the job because they're different for every company, right? Like mm -hmm. the sales process of my company is going to be very different from the sales process at EdUp, which I don't know if you do selling, but <laughs> I'm here, so sold me. Um, <laughs> no, so the, the, the sales process is very different. So, so my point is, is, then why would they spend the same amount of time learning sales that they would software development? They shouldn't. Yeah. So, so our, that's Point. why our tech sales bootcamp is eight weeks. And that comes right back into the demographics, which is our learners who are in, who are coming through our programs are generally want to spend less time in a program and get the skills to come out with a job. So that eight week program fits nicely for the learners we serve, for the outcomes we want. And for the differentiation. Now, the last piece I'll say there, okay, it's an eight-week program. Does that mean it should be the same cost as our software development bootcamp? And no. So the mm. programs range from eight to 16 to 24 weeks. The 16-week programs are the digital marketing data analytics, eight weeks of tech sales, 24 weeks is UX and, um, and software development. And, for, and we correlate the amount of time to the course by the cost of the course. So sorry, we took, correlate the cost of the course to the time of the course. So the mm -hmm. tech sales bootcamp is the least expensive. The 16 week courses are the sort of the middle tier. Then the highest tier would be UX and software development. So a lot of what we do at Upright is not, and I love that my, one of my, um, uh, one of my colleagues the other day said, one of the things I love about Upright is we don't do things differently to do them differently, we do them differently to get it, to do it the right way. Mm. Um, and that's a lot of how we get to the decisions we make around how we uh, build courses and who we partner with. Oh, okay. I, I got it. This is a, a great context that you've been uh, putting in place for me and for the listeners. And so one of the things that um, I've been thinking about is the decision to partner up with colleges. I know you partner with colleges and companies, which we can get into, but I want to focus on the colleges, obviously, the higher education podcast. But so there are a lot of standalone boot camps, right? I mean, they just kind of do their own thing and they get their leads and people pay them. And so so why the the want or the need or or the idea to to partner with colleges specifically? Yep, great question. So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it back to a story. Um, oh, I love stories. Go, man. Younger, <laughs> I um, I lived in a town that was, I mean, for for my high school years, um, I lived in a town that was like I think two thousand residents total. Mm -hmm. So there was nothing there. It had like a store, and you know, it had a, a gas station, and then maybe twenty minutes away, there was the so there was the closest. I'll use air quotes city. Uh, I say that that with air quotes because it was tiny. It's like six, seventy thousand people. Yeah. So growing up, there was no Chipotle. Um, 
there was like, you know, your chain of fast food places like McDonald's, whatever. But mm -hmm. Chipotle was kind of, I don't know if you felt this way, Elvin, but kind of growing up, Chipotle was like you were hoping your town would get a Chipotle, right? Because that was like... <laughs> it was fancy back when I was growing yeah, up. Ooh, exactly. Chipotle, that's fancy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so I used to go to a school that was an hour away from where I lived. I drove there and back every day. And, um, and I would go to the school... And it was sort of in a somewhat urban area, a little more urban, at least than where I lived. And there was a Chipotle and I'd grab a burrito on my way home from school and I'd like eat half in the car, drip it all over myself and then, you know, get home and then uh, have half like saved. And then my friends would come over and we'd like do homework together, you know, um, or do sports. And um, and they'd be like, I'd, I'd whip out my other half of the Chipotle, the burrito. And they were like, what is that? And I was like, ah, it's a Chipotle burrito. Like you guys never heard of this. So anyways, long story short, Three years later, um, after, you know, I'd graduated and went to college and, you know, went on with my life, I started seeing the the kids who stayed, stayed, uh, stayed in my hometown, start to post about Ch Chipotle. And that's because the Chipotle came near the town. They're like, oh, this amazing burrito, et cetera. That is education. It is regional. If oh. it is not offered locally, you'd be surprised how many people don't participate. Mm. And that is a very difficult part that I think educators, ed tech companies, and um, specifically mostly ed tech companies are not really wrapping their heads around, is that even if you can create a national brand, the odds that somebody will actually engage with that brand and trust it mm. in areas that we serve, regional populations, you know, d d or tertiary markets, places like the place I grew up. They don't know it exists and therefore they don't participate. Another interesting anecdote, when you, where I grew up, when you walked down the street, you didn't see your neighbor, you know, writing code from their living room. They were <laughs> coming home with oil spills on their shirt or fixing yeah. car parts in their front lawn or, you know, carrying the, you know, you know, coming home from their, their shift that, you know, they're at the supermarket or the gas station yeah. and, that's what we knew of career landscapes or there was the professionals there were doctors and lawyers and you know who whatever helps keep the keep a um, you know keep it keep a, a suburban or small town alive the point is is that again you as a young person don't even know about the career opportunities that live in tech until you're exposed to them you know, I didn't even under, know what UX design was until I got my first job at, at a at an advertising agency and 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 met somebody who um who I really enjoyed spending time with who uh who introduced me to the field he worked in. So the point is is like you we as professionals think that there is this incredible exposure because we know it already. Yeah. But you got to think about the 20 some odd years people spend not knowing of it. And that's the reason we work with colleges and universities is because they are the gatekeepers and the entryway for a lot of folks to know what a career is. And mm. a lot of where that starts is at your community college. Should you register for the Middle States Commission on Higher Education annual conference this December 4th through 6th in Philadelphia? 100%. I agree, because the title of the conference is called Setting the Standard, Transformation Through Accreditation. There is no time like the present to explore opportunities in higher education and the future for our students and our business model. Get out and network with your peers this December 4th through 6th at the Middle States Commission on Higher Education annual conference. Attention. Are you ready to elevate your institution's marketing and enrollment strategies? Join the Edup Experience podcast at the Insights EDU conference, February 20th to 22nd in Phoenix, Arizona. Don't miss out on this opportunity to hear from engaging speakers from industry leading companies like Google, LinkedIn, Adobe, and higher ed leaders. Learn the latest marketing and enrollment strategies to grow your programs. Register now at insightsedu.com and use promo code Add up to save fifty dollars off your registration. Attention. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I love this. I love all of this, and and it's true. Man, you bring me back, Benny. You bring me back. I remember all the guys wearing the helmets, you know, and the boots, steel patrol boots, and coming home. And it's so funny. You don't see someone doing UX design on the street, man. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You didn't see that, and so I get it now. It totally makes sense. And so you go to these community colleges. And then you say to them, 
this we can do all this at no cost is that is that right that's right so so, so for, how does that work benny that's amazing yeah so we're a fee for service model meaning that we um we charge the students directly right and you're like oh, oh my god you charge students okay hold on let's take a break there so we charge <laughs> students but yeah. that's after we take in a lot of grant funding that helps subsidize their costs so let's start at like let's let's use an average cost program. Let's say that the program is um let's say that it's nine thousand dollars. Okay. Nine thousand dollar boot camp. Okay, so that's pretty that's that's almost standard for what you see from some of the other competitors in the market. I mean, a lot of our, our a lot of the other boot camps are um somewhere between fifteen to thirty, but let's say nine thousand dollars. Mm-hmm. When somebody signs up for one of our nine thousand dollar boot camps, are they paying nine thousand dollars out of pocket? Absolutely not. That mm-hmm. is very rare. Um, although, you know, it's always great as the founder of the company to uh, to not have to deal with the financing partners, et cetera, and, and wait for grants to come in, but it's rare. And that doesn't happen all the time, right? So how do they, how do they cover that $9,000? Well, from the community colleges that we work with and the regional universities and even some of the large universities, they have one incredible trick up their sleeve. And you know what that is? What's that? It's grant funding. Uh, Some of those folks don't even know that the grants exist around them. There are, there is a, there is um, a pile in, in reserves from every uh, in, administration over the last 12 years from Obama to Trump to Biden that has stocked up in WIOA funding, which is the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. It's come to the, it's usually um, managed by the Department of Labor and, and dispersed on a, and has access and disbursement um, regulations on a state by state basis. But the to access a lot of that grant funding, you might be wondering why aren't other boot camps doing that? Well, to do that, you have to. And one of the stipulations we found is that you have to be an institution or a training company that's based in the state that you're taking the 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 that you're receiving the funding from mm-hmm. for over two years. So you have to have a, you have to exist in in wherever you know in in um you know let's call it I don't know um, let's call it Wyoming. You have to you know as a training company or institution been around for over two years. So that automatically nixes a lot of boot camps that are marketing nationally. Then you also have to be enrolling locally into the programs and then helping place the learners locally as well. So once again, that further sort of eliminates the oppor- this opportunity for national boot camps. But for companies like ours that are running these programs through community colleges or universities, they are colleges that have been there for a while. They are have built a great reputation. They already have they already have uh, entry points to uh, we owe a funding and what ends up happening is, and we always just one example, there are a lot of different grant funding, but what ended up happening is that $9,000 becomes Mm 5,000. So now you are offering what is like an industry standard product for $5,000, which is incredibly um, low cost when it comes, when, when you talk about the outcomes. Now, how does that $5,000 get covered? Well, we offer payment plans and um, and flexible loan options for learners who want to come in through who um, who who can, who want to take out a loan. And when you think about the when you when we talk about that scary word loan or or payment plan, um, <laughs> you know we we think okay well well yeah that's that's tough aren't, aren't we already all, all, all already facing a student debt crisis? Yes, mm-hmm. but the student debt crisis isn't about just the cost of college, it's about the ROI of the degree. Yeah. And so for us, the ROI of the program, we are placing over 90% of our learners within 67 days of graduating their program. And on average, they're seeing a 56% salary increase. So wow. that loan, that $5,000 has paid itself back within two months of the program of graduate of, of landing their job. And oftentimes within four months of ending the program. So we're we're not saying hey like come take our program take out a loan and then figure out what's next we're saying hey come take a program let's see what we can get you from 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 to to subsidize as much of the cost as possible to make it as as low uh, um as as low maintenance and um and and manageable for you and then after the program let's start to earn that back so that loan goes away 
Um, yeah. and so, and so that's where I think our model is just so phenomenal in terms of outcomes, um, in terms of accessibility, in terms of partnerships. And then what does it do? What's the best part of all of this? It helps the college look amazing. I mean, we're talking <laughs> about schools that are, you know, yeah. incredible institutions because of their namesake, their, their stay, their, um, their, their gravitas for reach, their, their, um, their campus, their accessibility. But we're also talking about schools that are limited in their, uh, built in their resources. Yeah. So you asked me, how is this low? How, how's this no cost for the college? A fee for service model means that we have a fee we take from the learner who pays us and then the grants or whatever that comes through. And so for, for the school that charges, you know, $9,000 for the program, you know, we have a fee that we take off of that 9,000, but they get to keep the rest. And what that means for these schools that get to keep um, the, a, a good portion of the, 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 the student's tuition and for us charging a fee to deliver that service, it means that they don't have to pay up front to offer world-class programs. Mm -hmm. And it also means that they're able to focus their energy on bringing more programs, workforce pro programs through their department that aren't just us or coding boot camps you, you, or, or boot camps in general. This is the most important, like the, I'll leave it at this. This is the most important thing to remember for colleges. It is partnerships with companies like ours or other workforce providers are not a this or that. They are a this and that. We need to get to be able to offer a diverse range of opportunities for folks who come from regional, from from tertiary, secondary markets, from rural populations, from you know the from the Vermonts, the Wyoming's, places that are between, right? Like like I said, like New York City and San Fran, yeah. because we need to make sure that they have the access to those opportunities. It is education is local. If you build mm -hmm. it, they will come. <laughs> I love that. I think we had uh, Matt Siegelman, who um, is over at the Burning Glass Institute, and he was talking about the, the power of education being local, even though he got some kickback about, well, what about online education now that it's, but still, I think he referenced some data points about how even online students are taking online courses at institutions that are within like a 30 mile radius of where they live. So, so that's super interesting. Um, I did want to uh, talk about because uh, Holyoke Community College, uh, Dr. Christina Royale, who I think has retired, she was on the podcast as a president when she was there, and she came back on and also co-hosted. And I see that you have a partnership with them and a case study, and it, and it sounds like it could really illuminate everything that you talked about in general and get specific. So when you talk about that case study real quick, um, could you also talk about Who's actually teaching these courses? Like, let's talk to us about the educators who are in the classrooms and, you know, is this online? Is it hybrid? I mean, how did it work out with uh, Holyoke? Yeah. So, um, so Dr. Christina Royale and I actually um, met at um, the HCC hmm. campus uh, mm -hmm. to do a joint signing with uh, Holyoke Community College and Springfield Technical Community College, which are um, actually probably within like, I think a 45 minute drive of each other. Um, we met at the STCC campus, um, and did a joint signing. So I think there's like actually a couple of pictures of us floating around on yeah, the internet. I've seen together. it. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, first of all, amazing leaders, um, yeah. Yeah. really just visionary, smart. Yep. That's it. Now what's funny is that, um, that's a really interesting one to bring up. Um, so that partnership with HCC and STCC was the first time we'd ever done a partnership with two colleges, A, as a joint signing, mm -hmm. um, but B, that we're so close to each other. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, like they, they're they not, it's not like we're talking about, you know, I don't know, like New Jersey City and New York City that are very close to each other, but in a lot of ways, very different. We're talking about two places that you would imagine would serve save, serve the same learner base. Exactly, yeah, good point. Yeah. And this is what was really interesting about the outcomes of, um, of that partnership. So with HCC, when we got together, they asked, first of all, should we do a joint signing? Like, does this sound like 
does it is there let's let's put it this way is there enough room for the both of us in in this mm -hmm. type of partnership and the truth is i we didn't know i wasn't entirely sure of whether or not we would have success with both programs um given their proximity and given how close they were now i can't go into numbers because um because it's it's we 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 can't disclose that without our our the permission of our partners and we tend not yeah. to generally mm -hmm. um but with stc and hcc and with hcc they're actually now some of our top enrollers both of them mm -hmm. um and they are both incredibly um diverse in terms of the types of learners they bring mm -hmm. and they also have um some of the highest outcomes from some of the, the uh from some of the partners that we work with. Now you might ask why. Why do these programs enroll well? Why do they have great outcomes? And why do they um and why do they uh and in in and what makes them so successful? Mm -hmm. Well let's let's look let's take a look at the where Springfield and Holyoke are, are located, right? These are in Western Massachusetts, in in towns that have historically had uh, once a booming industry town. Right, Springfield had yep. um, <clears throat> uh, a steady population growth, um, um, and you know also benefited from uh, the the height of the industrial revolution. Um, Holy Holyoke, similar, has some uh, has some has some great university presence, um, but over the last twenty to thirty years, towns like Springfield are like the towns that I grew up in that have faced some of the repercussions of the post-industrial economy. Yeah. Um, and what you find there is that there's still a lot of life of folks who want to achieve. And these are people who live within walking distance of the Springfield Technical Community College. We're talking about not 100, 200, we're talking about thousands of people who have who want to see opportunity from from their lives and want to transition to careers and sort of rely on SDCC and HCC and for the folks in Holyoke to bring those opportunities to table. And so for that reason, you're we're not we're looking at, yeah, maybe it's you know a city of fifty to a hundred thousand people, but in that city, there is a in each city there are or each area there are, thousands of people who want a career change. Now compare that to some of our, some, some to New York City, where I live, for instance. Mm -hmm. In New York City, there are millions of people. Mm -hmm. The competitiveness yeah. to, 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 to offer the types of programs we offer in Manhattan is huge. You yeah. have General Assembly, right? You, you don't have an access, you don't have a shortage of access to these types of programs in, mm -hmm. in New York City. But in STCC, and in HCC, you do. So they are prime examples of the exact types of colleges that enroll well for the exact reasons I mentioned earlier. Yeah, gotcha. And again, real quick, uh, who's who's teaching the, the courses? Are you guys sharing faculty? How does that work? <clears throat> so the way that our programs run is that we hire um, what we call practitioner faculty. So or our practitioner instructor. Um, mm -hmm. That means that uh, anyone who teaches any of our courses has to have over four years of, ex of professional experience in the field and has to have over uh, two to, has to have over two years of experience instructing. So that means that they're both practitioners and able to teach effectively on the on on the programs. Now, why do you want folks who are currently in the field teaching these programs? Mm -hmm. It's because they're going to be the most relevant in terms of the skills that we're teaching. They're going to know the most, uh, and they're going to know the skills that employers are looking for today. And what else does it do? It amplifies opportunities for learners to get placed after their program with folks who are uh, with with some of our instructors, which we've seen happen before. So, um, so the way that we hire instructors is um, we. We uh, bring on uh, we bring on instructors then and uh, that get approved from our college partners and then uh -huh. uh, then come into uh, come into instructor programs. But we hire part time instructors um, in with who often renew for a um, for their their second or third gig um, because they want to see the impact. Right. Like our instructors aren't necessarily people. We're not paying like uh, incredible wages for that will attract, 
you know, like lead engineer at Google, but why does sometimes, why does the lead engineer at Google want to teach our program sometimes? Yeah. It's because they love to see the outcomes and it's a, it's a great way to meet early talent. So it amplifies the opportunities from a hiring partner network and it presents folks an opportunity to, um, to get a fresh look at talent. So, um, and then it presents our colleges the opportunity to, to, um, to get a sense of the type of practitioners that are very good at teaching these types of programs. Okay, got it, got it. So real quick, before I give you the last two questions, I do want to just, if you could talk about how this all works with, with companies, because I'm, I'm just curious to kind of find out, is it very similar, similar model to the colleges or, or it's totally different? How does it work? So currently we're working with companies on a hiring model or on a hiring partner basis meaning that we are working with com employers that want to take a look at our graduates to um to uh, uh to to place them into uh into the, onto their team um and we're also rolling out an enterprise model where we are training incumbent workers on some of our boot camp programs um to help them accelerate their path to their next role either within the company or in general and um, the enterprise model is um, is really looking at some of the larger um, some of the larger uh, companies and and and, um, and organizations that could that have uh, frontline workers and also opportunities for advancement, but um, in in digital skilled areas. Um, and then for our hiring for our hiring partners, we work with um, companies that have some type of hiring need within their organization that our boot camps fill. And then to maintain their hiring partner status, they have to actively participate in our programs, meaning they do lunch and learns, they come to our demo days, or they do mock interviews. And so by, by actively participating in our programs, they're able to keep their hiring partner status, which means they're also able to get a look at talent and it costs them nothing. So we don't charge our partners anything to hire from us. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't charge our partners to um, to recruit from the programs. Um, but what we ask is that if you're going to, um, if you're going to take, uh, you know, if you're going to um, take a look at our talent, then we also want you to be a part of our community. And that's been really effective in helping our learners get jobs. Wow, that, that sounds like an awesome program, Benny. I, I love that a lot. The fact that you don't charge them and then just be a part of the, community and the mock interviews i think i just think that model is genius i'm a, a big fan of that i'm glad you we touched upon that that's great um okay benny this has been fascinating man i really appreciate your time let's wrap up last two questions we covered a lot but in case uh is there anything that we didn't cover that you wanted to cover today so feel free to talk about that and um i love to ask everyone this question doesn't matter you know if they work in or out of higher education but uh i'm always trying to get different perspectives so what do you see as the future of higher education? I think there's going to be a really big movement towards reskilling and even more than there has been in the last 10 years and the next 10 years. Yeah. Um, I think that the, the, the word upskilling and reskilling deserves their own distinction when we talk about um, mm -hmm. what that means from a service model perspective, um, meaning oh. that we often talk about re upskilling and reskilling together, but if you really differentiate between the two upskilling is more providing skills for like incumbent workers or folks to, um, to, to add auxiliary skills into their resume mm -hmm. and reskilling is training for new careers. Mm. We are going to have to train for a lot of new careers over the next 10 years. So we see advancements in AI and automation um, there. They say that there'll be somewhere around 89 million jobs lost between now and um, 2030 in, due to um, automation and, and, uh, and advancements in artificial intelligence. Um, and the World Economic Forum does predict that of those 89 million, um, there will be over 90 million new jobs um, created. So we are always looking, and I, and I think that a lot of the conversation around AI and automation right now in terms of reskilling is, is really like around job loss and in in the fear is will the jobs will there actually be new jobs gained that's really the biggest question is is you know when we look at you know concepts of like universal basic income or or ways to you know mitigate um the the massive job loss that we're destined to see over the next 10 years we i think we are a little bit too doomsday and we're not really looking at the incredible opportunities that automation and, and, and AI is presenting for job creation. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's, uh, the, the, but I do think that these new jobs or the way that jobs are going to change is going to require 
a very firm understanding of how to use and complete and always understand the evolving need of uh, AI within the job that you do. So for instance, like a marketer today needs to know chat GPT or, um, or, uh, or jobs that, or tools that make content writing or editing easier and faster, because if they don't, um, there's going to be somebody else who can do their job a lot quicker. So the, that's just one example. Another example is, you know, a, a, a software engineering manager needs to understand how uh, to scale code and understand how to solve problems, right? Because that's what coders really do. They don't just write code, they, they solve problems. And if we can get, um, if we can get, uh, if we have, you know, machine learning and, and large language models that are able to solve those or um, to write that code quicker, then they can focus more of their time on solving problems. They need to know how to use those technologies. And so I think that a lot of what that means for higher education is that a lot of the a lot of the subjects we teach, everything from writing to reading to to math to uh, science to um, to technology, are all going to have to be augmented significantly to be relevant to today. It'd be like the equivalent of teaching math without a calculator, right? Mm -hmm. So like we have to think about what does that mean from a curriculum shift and yeah. what does it present for career opportunities over the next 10 years? Um, and so for, for what that, for, for, for the short term and, and when we talk about the future, I think we look probably past the next 10 years, but like, let's talk about the immediate future, right? I see a massive need to shift curriculum fast, mm -hmm. um, and be very responsive for, to the market. And now big ships don't turn on a dime, right? So making those changes takes a long time for universities. So they're going to rely on partners like us to be able to at least have those skills ready to go on the non-credit side. So that's the immediate future. What do I see for the long-term future? Now, this is an interesting, this is where I see sort of like the interesting maybe opportunity for schools. Um, I think that there's going to be a lot more community-based education over the next 40 years. Um, and what that means is that when we look at the way that workplaces have evolved, right? If we look at like, I don't know, a really great example being um, the 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 office, right? Yeah. I went so the the large corporate office in New York City is no longer as prevalent as it was, of course, pre pandemic. And so when you look at commercial real estate and some of the challenges that that market and industry is facing right now, you can see sort of how you know, opportunities for smaller, more regional offices make, um, uh, make for, you know, work, uh, a shift in how people, you know, come into the workplace. I think it's going to, I think that's going to happen a lot for schools. So I think that the traditional classroom, as we know it, at, in terms of you come in, you get the lecture, you sit down in class, et cetera, is going to go through a very similar shift. And that, the, and I think when I went to the STCC campus, they did this very well. I think that building a campus that people love to be at and where that supports remote learning in conjunction with community-based education with, with, uh, with, with, uh, whether that's through cohorts or, um, or shared understanding in, in, in terms of subject material amongst learners and peer-to-peer -peer engagement is going to have a really positive in effect, impact on the way that we see universities in terms of their delivery model. Um, and it also is going to open the door to a lot of different subjects through a lot of different, um, through a lot of, um, uh, into a lot of, uh, into a lot of, uh, new, um, industries that we don't even know exist today. So, um, I don't know if I really think that the, the, the classroom as we know it today is going to stay the same, but I do believe that the campus and the local and regional sort of dynamics that the, that is is true to the community of college um, is going to be a profound and positive um, is going to go through a profound and and positive uh, shape shift over the next twenty to forty years. Wow, um, fascinating! This Benny, this is awesome. I, I really appreciate your your insights. I'm sure our listeners will. Um, I'll, if you want to learn more about uh, Benny uh, and Upright Education, they can go to, I think it's uprighted.com, right, Benny? Uh, it's uprighted.com. Yep, uprighted.com. Yeah, upright ed 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 okay. Yeah, great. And um, and Benny's on, on LinkedIn, so I highly recommend reach out to, to Benny. We'll put the 
uh, website uh, and then Benny's LinkedIn uh, in the show notes for this episode. So this has been great. Um, so Benny, how have you uh, experienced your EdUp experience today? It was great. I loved your questions um, and I'm so happy to be here. Huge fan of the show. Awesome. Awesome. We appreciate you, Benny. Thanks so much. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, let me outro him. He is Benny Boas. And he is the CEO of Upright, Upright Education. That's Upright Education, the CEO. So uh, thanks again, Benny, for being on. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, you've just it up. Oh, uh, yeah. The Middle States Commission on Higher Education 2023 Annual Conference is in Philadelphia, December 4th through 6th. Setting the standard transformation through accreditation. Remember, only you can create transformation through networking, knowledge sharing, opportunity, leadership, service, learning, and accreditation. And you'll do all those things at the Middle States Commission on Higher Education Annual Conference this December, 4th through 6th. Can't wait to be there. EdUp will be there. There's going to be over 1,300 attendees, presidents, provosts. The networking opportunities are off the chain. Register now at msche.org. Oh, yeah. Attention, higher ed marketing and enrollment management professionals. We are taking the EdUp Experience podcast to Insights EDU. Join us at Insights EDU on February 20th to 22nd, 2024 in Phoenix, Arizona. Gain insight into the latest higher education trends and cutting edge marketing strategies that'll take your institution's enrollment to a whole new level. This is your opportunity to connect with higher education leaders and marketing experts from across the country. Comprehensive presentations, engaging panel discussions, and more. Insights EDU will equip you to position your institution for growth. Register now at insightsedu.com and use the code EDUP to save $50 off your registration. Can you afford to miss this conference? I don't think so.